All right. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming to uh, this talk, which is labeled CRISPR. Um, but actually, uh, we'll be talking about harnessing new CRISPR systems. So I'm Jonathan, uh, and this is Omar. Um, we're both members of Feng Zhang's lab, who I believe spoke yesterday and will be probably pretty present throughout. Um, but I was also a USABO alum in 2008 and 2009. So you may have heard of what CRISPR is, but um, let's give a little bit of backstory of what CRISPR can do and why it's needed. So with the initial sequencing of the human genome and countless genomes afterwards, um, many more genomes are being understood, and now we have a good grasp of both the biology of many diseases, but also of what different gene variants can do. So with this information, we've begun to understand that b the many differences between different members of the population can lead to many pathogenic variants. So for example, sickle cell disease, cystic fibrosis, and macular degeneration among many other diseases can be caused by losses of genes or as little as single uh, base pair mutations in genes. So of course, it'd be very useful to have tools that we can use to manipulate the genome to actually prevent or cure these diseases. At the same time, we have a better understanding of how certain variants among the population can actually have protective causes. So at the very uh, end of this is the CCR5 mutation, which can actually uh, cause immunity to HIV. But of course, more subtle uh, mutations, such as APOE mutations or mutations involved in diabetes, that can reduce risk or cause certain protective uh, scores to enhance uh, across many different diseases. And the need to actually be able to manipulate you know, the genetic code um, extends beyond human health uh, directly. So there's many different genetic traits that can be used to improve agriculture, for example. So uh, insect resistance, drought resistance, increased yield of crops. Just past couple weeks, there was new uh, cultivation of uh, new tomatoes and uh, other plants by using genetic engineering. So this all kind of demands tools that can really have the ability to very precisely search through and edit specific parts of the genome, uh, somewhat like the search bar in Microsoft Word, where you can get to a part of a large document and then change it. So how do we actually make tools like that? So it's nice to actually go back to natural diversity, and this really is because the same technologies that power the sequencing of you know, many different humans also power the sequencing of millions of different microbes. So we now have a much larger picture of genetic diversity, and that actually allows us to steal from nature and create new tools. So if you look at many of the innovations that have occurred throughout biotechnology in the past you know, 40 or 50 years, um, many of them actually come directly from natural diversity that we've harnessed. So you may be familiar with some of these applications, um, optogenetics, that's the ability to control neurons with light, and uh, Fung was also very integral in that effort. But uh, most recently, gene editing and the use of kind of proteins to target the genome has been a great utility. So what is CRISPR? So this is kind of what people, when they talk about CRISPR, what they are really thinking of. It's a protein, it's Cas9, and its power is that it's guided by this RNA called the sgRNA, and that hones it by just, uh, programming 20 letters to a point in the genome. But actually, in, during this talk, Omar and I would like to emphasize that Cas9, er, oh, CRISPR, CRISPR is actually uh, a much larger system. So the CRISPR system is actually an adaptive immune system that is this whole complex, and Cas9 is only a small part. So it really is this powerful tool, but it, it occurs in this much larger diversity of a bacterial immune system, and that biology can actually help us develop new tools. But what does Cas9 allow us to do? So for example, you can take cells out of a patient and you can modify them to actually uh, correct mutations such as sickle cell or uh, install new uh, potential powers like the ability to target cancer cells within your body in the field of immunology. And then you can put those cells back into the patient. But even more than that, you can actually uh, attack uh, mutations that occur within organs like the liver and you can uh, install protective variants or correct mutations inside of a patient using in vivo editing. So 
Even beyond that, Cas9 and other DNA targeting enzymes that we've discovered have allowed many different things. You can do DNA, DNA cleavage, which allows genome editing. But going beyond that, you can even uh, inactivate the ability of Cas9 to cut the genome and just have it honed to the genome so you can turn genes on. And you can uh, fuse proteins to it that can actually affect epigenetics. So you can modulate the epigenetic state of genes. And even more recently, there have been efforts to fuse it to proteins that you can take to the genome and you can see actually specific locations of the genome. And actually just this week, there was a paper where uh, scientists on the West Coast actually used Cas9 to drag parts of the genome to other areas in the nucleus to understand. So it is really a very rich and powerful toolbox for understanding DNA. But if you know a little bit of biology, there's both DNA and RNA. And so one question that Omar and I were pursuing when we started graduate school was, what could we do with the power to target RNA uh, instead of DNA? So, get this out here. Cool. Cool. So, um, Jonathan gave a really great sort of introduction to CRISPR and Cas9 um, and how it can be used for a lot of different sort of DNA toolbox uh, strategies. Um, but what was kind of really interesting to us when we both joined uh, grad school a few years ago in Fung's lab was, is there more out there beyond Cas9? And if we can find those proteins in sort of the bacterial diversity, can we use them for new tools? And so it turns out when you look at Cas9 in sort of the CRISPR universe, it's actually really a small slice at the bottom. And there's a lot of other types of protein systems and all sorts of bacteria and archaea. And so we wondered if we could use a computational strategy um, to sort of mine signatures of CRISPR systems, pull out new potential systems, and actually characterize them experimentally um, to see if they actually were functional. And, and so what we found is we found a lot of DNA targeting systems. Cas9 is one example. We also found another enzyme called CPF1, another one called Cas12b. And they all had really interesting prop, uh, you know, properties for cutting DNA. They expanded the genome targeting uh, abilities because Cas9 does have some sequence preferences, and our new enzymes could target other types of sequences. And so there was a, you know, a really a promise for um, identifying new enzymes. But perhaps one of you know, the most interesting findings from this search was this enzyme called Cas13. And that's because unlike you know, a lot of the new DNA targeting systems we found, it actually was able to target RNA. It defended bacteria against RNA phage. Um, and it opened up potentially a really um, interesting uh, sort of platform for RNA tools, which have been quite limited um, up until now. And Cas13 is interesting because instead of cutting uh, DNA like Cas9, where it just makes a double strand break, it actually can cut RNA in a lot of different places. It eventually leads to uh, degradation of the RNA. And it actually had a unique property where after binding its target, it could actually just cleave any RNAs that were nearby, um, kind of like a self destruct switch if the bacterial infection couldn't be uh, overcome. So, uh, Using this tool, we've um, been able to harness these different RNA targeting features for a variety of applications. Um, given our time, I think we wanted to just focus on RNA editing and um, ways to do nucleic acid detection, which um, is sort of the first demonstration of CRISPR diagnostics and a way to go beyond therapeutics. Um, so for RNA editing, um, the strategy we took was there's a lot of natural enzymes that allow for adenosine to inosine conversions. So you know there's four letters for DNA code. Um, this one specifically allows for a conversion of an A to an inosine, which is read out as a G. So you're eventually you're making an A to G um, switch. And there turns out to be thousands of genetic diseases where if you could convert an A to a G, you could actually uh, treat them using this conversion. And so the idea is we can actually recruit this enzyme, which is called an ADAR, using Cas13 to the site of an RNA that we want to mutate using the guide RNA. And it would allow for targeted conversion of this A to a G using this recruitment enzyme. And here, the Cas13 is actually catalytically dead. So it's not cutting the RNA, but it's allowing us to recruit these um, base editing enzymes. Um, and so that turns out to be um, a really powerful approach for RNA editing. We like to give a lot of our technologies acronyms. So in this case, we went with REPAIR, which I think is a rather apt acronym. Um, and we're pretty excited about it because um, it really enables a, a lot of different types of uh, correction. So for one, we can correct Mendelian diseases, so mutations that are G to A that are bad, we can correct back 
to normal. So diabetes is an example of um, these types of variants. We can do multiplexed creation of, of bases. So for example, like APOE4, which is a risk variant for Alzheimer's, involves multiple base changes in humans. So if you could have a way to really make high efficient uh, edits using a system like repair, um, you could treat variants like that. Um, A to G changes can be used for modulating splicing. So the way genes are read out um, is actually rather complex. One gene can actually encode many different types of uh, structures of the, the way they're expressed. And so you can change the way that information is expressed uh, through modulation of splicing. And of course, you can modulate protein function. So you know, KRAS in cancer can be uh, sort of turned inactive by modulating sites on the protein using A to G editing. You can also edit phosphorylation sites and other types of enzymes. And collectively, um, why we find RNA editing to be more exciting than DNA editing is there are a lot of um, issues with off-targets for DNA editing. With RNA editing, everything you do is temporary. So the idea of uh, the, you know, the risk is really reduced. Um, and also with RNA editing, it's very useful for transient modulation. So if you have a heart attack and want to promote regeneration of tissue, you can actually do that by modulating phosphorylation sites on enzymes that can promote regeneration. And you're basically then, uh, you just deliver this technology for you know, maybe a few weeks until you get regenerated tissue. Um, so it's, essentially, it's kind of like thinking about a pill for gene therapy, you know, a way that you can modulate your genetics temporarily. Um, and so then the other thing uh, we tried to develop using CAS13 was uh, diagnostics. And so this is enabled by that um, sort of promiscuous cleavage I mentioned earlier. The idea is if Cas13 can recognize a target and then cleave any RNA in solution, we can add a reporter molecule, um, which is sh shown as the cleavage reporter. That's essentially an RNA with a fluorophore and quencher on each side. So when that gets cleaved by this promiscuous cleavage, you get release of fluorescence. And so now, basically, if you want to find a blue molecule in a sea of many molecules, you design a guide RNA that can recognize that molecule. It'll bind with Cas13. It'll activate Cas13. You'll get cleavage of this fluorescent reporter. And that really allows um, for highly sensitive and rapid diagnostics. We also made an acronym for this uh, called SHERLOCK. Um, and that stands for Specific High Sensitivity Enzymatic Reporter Unlocking. Um, we have to go through a lot of different detectives to find an acronym that works. Um, <laughs> but that. <laughs> Um, and so what that really allows for is we showed a variety of applications, but we can do rapid you know, Zika, dengue um, detection straight from patient samples. We can do uh, rapid bacterial detection. So if someone comes in sick in the ER, we can diagnose sepsis in a matter of hours instead of days. Um, we've shown that it can be freeze-dried for point of care detection, genotyping, and of course, um, liquid biopsy detection. So like you can detect DNA mutations in someone's blood. Um, and so, you know, we really find that the DNA toolbox is getting really full because of Cas9, which is shown in the red part of this toolbox. But we're really excited about filling in the blue part, where we can use Cas13 as a platform for modulating RNA biology, recruiting all sorts of enzymes to um, also perturb RNAs and uh, study disease. So um, with that, we just want to say thank you. Um, you know, Fung is an amazing mentor, and it's, we got really lucky uh, to be in his lab and work on these really cool technologies. And of course, many other members in the lab, particularly David, Patrick, Ryan, and Max, which are students that work with us, um, Sergey, and um, of course, our collaborators, Eugene, Jim, and Constantine. So thank you. How much uh, of a length of a sequence is needed to uniquely identify a position in the genome? In other words, if you wanted to have basically something that's programmed to find a particular mutation and fix it, um, how much do you need to have in order to be unique and not accidentally fix something that doesn't need fixing? Yeah, so for Cas13, um, it's very sensitive to single mismatches. So um, it basically can be as unique as just a single base pair. Um, and that uh, works really well. Um, for Cas9, uh, you know, there are off targets. In, uh, and so maybe generally you can get off targets if it's a sequence that's two or three mismatches off. Um, so you have to be clever about how you design your guides. I was and asking yeah. more about the length of the sequence yeah. defined that contains that two or three that's off. Yeah, so I mean, the most sensitive part of the guide RNA is the beginning, which is maybe a region of five or six base pairs. Um, so if that can be unique, that's the most important driving factor. So maybe five base pairs. Yeah. Yeah. How do you think about deliver them in the, uh, this region into you know, tissue to treat? Is it small enough to fit in the <coughs> AAV virus? 
Yeah, that's a great, really great question. So um, for there's a lot of different delivery methods to put things into tissues in patients, and a really popular one is uh, adeno-associated viruses, or AV, but they have a packaging limitation, um, and that limitation is about five kilobases. Um, and the cas alone can pe be packaged, um, but cas fused to the ADAR is a little bit big. So one thing that we're trying is, well, you don't need all of the machinery of CAS13 to really do this function because we're not really cutting the RNA, and so a lot of the catalytic mechanisms that are involved in cleavage are dispensable. So what we've been doing is we've been actually truncating the protein and doing mutagenesis to find different variants that are smaller but still work for RNA editing, um, allowing us to package it. And we actually have a variant that works pretty well and can be packaged as a, as a single vector. Um, we're trying to make it smaller always. But yeah, I think that's a, a good promising uh, direction. One more question. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.